Good morning, everybody. I am really glad to see that so many of you have made it over here after our excellent morning session with Jim G, who's just walking in. And uh, the mic is now on. <laughs> so what I was saying is that I'm really glad to see that so many of you have made it over here after our very excellent opening this morning with Jim G, who just walked in, and Leslie and Yasser, who are also here. I just saw them a moment ago. Uh, and we're now continuing with our other excellent lineup of, um, of presentations. And before I uh, do that, I just wanted to thank our sponsors again, because they really have made this day possible. Microsoft Research, Microsoft Studios, uh, JP, Morgan, JP Morgan Chase, the Technology for Social Good Group, Motorola Solutions Foundation, and the McGraw-Hill Center for Digital Innovation. All of those have uh, helped out tremendously. And uh, now we're, we're diving into um, the first session. It was a slight change in authors, but we have uh, Jeff Curley from iCivics, uh, Derek Lomas from PlayPower, Dan White from Filament Games, and Karina Lynch from BrainPop, and we're very excited to have them open the day. So, welcome. So the format we're going to take today is we're going to quickly introduce everybody here and a little bit, a little bit more about their, their companies and their games, and um, then we're going to do some questions and answers and hopefully leave about five minutes for questions and answers from the audience. So there were some really great uh, questions after the keynote this morning, and hopefully we can continue that conversation here. Um, so I'm Karina from BrainPop. BrainPop is currently used in about 20% of U.S. schools. Um, we launched GameUp this year to push the very best learning games into the hands of teachers and students. GameUp is, uh, is a, a partnership of some of the very best people out there making educational games right now. Um, the games are free to use for, for students and teachers, and they're free for partners to put those games on, on GameUp. Um, this is uh, the homepage of GameUp. Um, it's incredibly easy for, for teachers and students to dive right into the game experience. Um, I'll show you uh, an example here. This is a, a brain pop topic on um, Brown versus the Board of Ed Education. If teachers and students were working with this topic, they would be able to um, uh, watch an animated movie ab about the topic, work with some interactive activities, and then there's a huge game button driving them to, to play a game where they can actually take on the role um, uh, and, and argue the Supreme Court case in front of uh, in front of the Supreme Court, they can actually argue the case, which we think is, is, is taking, taking our product and pairing it with the very best games out there and making a much more meaningful experience for, for kids. So um, Game Up this year has had about 25 million page views. Um, students have spent almost 900,000 hours playing games on Game Up. About 1.9 million of those page views have been iCivics games. Uh, so this is an iCivics game you're taking a look at right now. And uh, iCivics was founded by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor to bring effective and engaging civics education to students. And this is a Play Power Labs. The Play Power Labs won an impact prize in last year's inaugural STEM game uh, video game challenge. And their games help, lumber, uh, help students develop a strong number sense. And this is a, an example of one of their games. They are awesome and teachers love them. Um, this is a, a really cool filament game. Um, filament Games recently won an SIA innovation, uh, innovation Prize, and they make many of the, the best learning games that are out there. A lot of our partner games on GameUp were actually uh, made by Filament Games. Um, so we thought with, with this talk, we're not going to debate whether or not uh, games actually belong in school, because we feel like that argument's already been made and it's been answered. It's, Check, yes, done. They belong in school. So what we're going to talk about here is, is the how. How do we get good games in school and schools, and how do teachers use them effectively? Um, so we'll do a couple of questions and answers here. And uh, my first question is, um, school's obviously not the place, the only place where learning happens. So why should games be designed with formal learning spaces in mind, and how does one do that well? Anybody gets welcome to take that one. <laughs> I'll start off just by saying that um, just because there are, uh, school is a formal learning space, there's lots of informal learning that takes place within schools. And mm -hmm. so one of the ways in which games can um, engage for learning is by approaching those informal learning spaces in schools. Uh, that doesn't address the question of uh, how to produce games for formal learning. I think for us, and uh, Alan Gershenfeld touched a lot on these issues early on, um, 
we, we really wanted to make sure that our games were informed by uh, teachers, that all of our design uh, met time restrictions in schools, software and hardware limitations in schools. Um, we wanted to try and figure out what level of facilitation uh, we were expecting teachers uh, to give the games, and then what sort of supplemental resources we wanted to provide around the games. Uh, so early on, we brought uh, teachers from around the country to the Supreme Court. We were lucky enough to have that venue, so we got a pretty high attendance rate, and we just sort of sat around and jammed with them about what, um, what they would want to see in their classrooms or in their computer labs. Yeah, I would, I would add to, I would echo Jeff's comments about time. Obviously, time for teachers is paramount. And so you have to deliver a very good learning experience in a very short amount of time. So when we design games at Filament, oftentimes we'll create a core learning loop that can happen within a class period. And then there'll be some kind of extended experience that the student can engage with on their own time after school. Um, the other thing is simplicity. This is one thing that we struggle with a lot at Filament. So if you think about how the commercial game space works, a lot of times when we go to buy a game, that we want to play, it's a game that we can already kind of picture being able to play in our heads. And so for teachers um, who may not have necessarily the same level of literacy that we have as gamers, uh, the games that they can play in their heads oftentimes are very simple skill and drill games. So how do we meet them where they are without making the games that we don't want to make and get them to where we want them to be in terms of playing the games that we think are more valuable in the school system? And I don't know the answer to that yet. It's difficult. Um. All right, well, failure plus school doesn't exactly bring up positive connotations, yet Will Wright says games provide an opportunity for failure-based learning. Um, how does this apply to your games, and how do we make it okay for students to take risks in school? Well, I think one of the things that uh, have as an um, important aspect of games is that they're, they allow for many, um, you're expected to try and try again, and so, uh, we try to design our games around that um, as a, a learning loop, I suppose. Um, and so um, when the point is to, to try and not necessarily to succeed, and a student's able to respond to the feedback in a way that lets them learn, that's where we feel like we're being successful. Yeah, my, my concern is, so I mean obviously a self-assessment is on everybody's minds right now. And we get a pro, when, when we develop a game for a client, assessment always comes up. And the question is, is it stealth assessment? Is it embedded assessment? Is it assessment that lives outside of the game? And I think that assessment can be very positive from the perspective that it offers the student an opportunity to reflect critically on what they just did in the game and make explicit some of the connections that might, other, might not otherwise happen. My fear is that um, there has to be a very open and honest dialogue with the student about what the gameplay experience is being used for. Is it going into a grade book? Is it just a dichotomous, this person participated or did not participate? And I don't want to see games become high stakes experiences because then we lose everything that we like about playing games. So how do you maintain what Derek is talking about, the, the failure cycle that allows people to experiment and learn in games that we all know and love, um, but at the same time, try to develop an understanding of what they know from the game. Yeah, and, and, and just to kind of add on to that, I think um, to uh, quote G, Jim, uh, Jim G, at G on G at G for C, um, <laughs> you know, he said it's really about, you know, copious data well represented uh, for the student and for the teacher. And that's just an incredibly hard design challenge. Um, you have to let the student know why he or she is struggling in a game um, real time and in an informed way, and also let the teacher know um, what sort of uh, interjection may be necessary to help sort of correct the student's trajectory in the game. I think that that's one of the big opportunities is um, because these games can be designed for the classroom context, and the teacher is a part of that context, how to create aspects of the gameplay that loop the teacher into the student's learning. So you're not just relying on the game, but on the context around the game. So uh, maybe that's a good one. I'll, I'll skip down to this question. Also, um, James Paul G. says that only half, learnings, half of learning from games actually takes place within the game and the other half takes place in affinity spaces where people discuss the game, mod the game, explicate everything into a wiki, et cetera. And even if that's talking about some online space, how can, how can that work? Uh, how can we create affinity spaces within schools and, and blend that all together? 
<laughs> no pressure, Derek. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> can you get him to jump in here? How can we do it? <laughs> Some thought leadership. Um, I guess my first thought is that um, when there's a classroom context, you not only have the teacher, but you have the, um, the competition from other students. And um, whether they're cooperating against, whether they're competing against each other or just in a competitive mode, um, we see in the classrooms where students are always looking over at what they're doing. Um, so even when you're playing on a, a screen, um, there's, there's always multiple people in that context. And so that, that can be very valuable when students are talking to each other around the games. Um, and, and that's what's nice about a classroom as well, is that you can have a lot of kids playing games together and have these informal dialogues around the games. Yeah, I don't know if this speaks so much to the affinity space idea, but I think tied to that is the concept of preparation for future learning, which we've all heard Jim talk about extensively. And I would like to use this opportunity to actually parrot a really interesting presentation that I saw at GLS last week, and that was Dylan Arena, where he'd done a study uh, where he had kids play Civilization and Call of Duty, and then take a test, and then have a lecture, and then take another test. And the interesting thing was that the test that happened directly after the students played the game showed no variance, no, no uh, learning gains. But then after the lecture, uh, they did. And this was in comparison to a lecture where the students didn't play the games beforehand. So it was his study uh, demonstrated uh, that there was a significant impact associated with the idea that the game created this context for the student to process the information that they then received later in the lecture. And whether it's a lecture or a teacher going student to student or providing a debriefing after the game, something where there's some kind of scaffolding outside of the game, uh, I think is absolutely paramount. Yeah, uh, this is um, really important to us at iCivics, and I'll just be honest, I don't know if we've completely figured it out. I mean, we, we are always trying to encourage uh, teachers and students to mod our games, to make lessons off of our games. So, for instance, the Argument Wars uh, game that was featured, we've had teachers write lessons about how to write their own case content. Um, it's a very basic argumentative uh, game mechanic, and we've had teachers go out and then publish those lessons on you know, Better Lesson or on different forums. And uh, that's something that we, we strongly encourage. We, try and pub we publish all of our things under Creative Commons so teachers can have that ability to remix and, and sort of tweak uh, our lessons and our games. Uh, and we will do whatever we can to try and encourage that. So one thing that your games uh, really encourage is systems thinking, problem solving, collaboration, genuine inquiry, while also promoting content knowledge. Um, how do you balance that? What's the right blend or, or secret recipe? I mean, so this for us was really the reason um, that iCivic settled on a game-based curriculum. I mean, if you think about civics and government, it is about navigating a system to get things accomplished, uh, to advance your own, uh, you know, your own initiatives within a society. And, and that argument really was what put Justice O'Connor over the top about the importance of games, that they're not just there to convey civic knowledge, but that they allow students to really occupy these spaces that we want them to occupy when they become adults. Um, and it builds that social and emotional intelligence um, that we expect and, and hope our citizens will have. I think for us, we take it on a game by game basis. Um, you know, the, well, I guess again, the quote Jim, um, you know, the content comes for free if the game is built well. Jim, you owe me a $20 bill after this talk. Um, and, and I think that that's, we really take that to heart when we're designing games. And sometimes we, sometimes the games that we design are, are more content focused. Like, for example, Do I Have a Right, which is a very simple game about learning your constitutional rights. On the other hand, we've developed games about systems thinking, so high-level concepts and quote-unquote 21st century skills, right, where we don't really think about content at all. Um, I, most of the time we're trying to, like you say, Karina, strike a balance someplace in the middle because I know that content is important to educators, and at the end of the day, um, there's some sort of assessment that has to take place that's going to be focused on content. Um, so we try to figure out how we can create systems that impart that content and then also have real learning as well. Um, I think we have a lot more questions, but maybe we should open it up to the, to the audience and see if there's any uh, burning questions that are out there. 
And I know there's two people with microphones if anyone uh, does have a question. See Dr. Bauer back there. Sure, the, the current structure of schools is actually fairly recent. So I think one thing that gets lost sometimes in these conversations is we're trying to match this new technology to a structure that is both fairly recent and actually hasn't worked very well. So a couple of you sort of hinted at this. How much do you think what you're doing is sort of Trojan horse? And how much of it is really trying to improve on a model that may have fundamental flaws to begin with? <laughs> I, I know Damn it's a simple you, question. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think it's um, a little misleading to think that there's only one system that's out there. So classrooms don't all just look in a particular way. And I think that increasingly technology itself is splitting up uh, the classroom. It's not just a lecture-based model. Um, I think increasingly there's a, um, a recognition. I mean, we were talking the other day about how computer labs are kind of going away. And instead, there's modules within a classroom. This isn't the only way. It's just one of many models that's being used. And so as you have group work take a greater role in the classroom, because <clears throat> not all the students are using the computer at a time. You might have one group using a computer, one group doing um, physical manipulatives, uh, other groups doing other things. Um, I think that the, the role for game designers is thinking about the multitude of contexts that exist and thinking about ways in which our games can, can fit into them. Um, so I, I, I would like to avoid the binaries of throw everything out or um, fix what's there. Yeah, I think for Filament, we have to think about our place on the landscape. So like BrainPop, we are a mission-driven company. Um, but we are a for-profit organization. We're not a not-for-profit. We're not an academic institution. So we have to balance the realities of what is needed on, um, you know, in the trenches, so to speak, today, and where we would like to see the institution of education go. And so I think we think our strategy essentially ignores the low-hanging fruit, but also doesn't um, exclusively focus on you know the five to ten year plan. We try to we try to land some plate right right in the middle. Can I just make one follow up on that? I wasn't talking about lectures specifically. The last question, which is a question of process and content, is a classic question that comes up in considering the current structure of education. But I would suggest that it's an artificial separation based on the technology that we've had to this point to educate people. So I didn't mean specifically getting rid of lectures. We have time for one more question. I, I actually wanted to um, just reference the recent report that came out through the Joan Gans Cooney Center in BrainPop because I think it was very well done um, for understanding the context of the use of games in the classroom. Uh, there's a bunch of videos that are available online which I think um, show a number of different examples of use of games. Uh, this I know is informing the way that we're trying to produce games that fit into those contexts. And um, our, my colleague Allison and, and Jessica from Joe Gans Cooney will be speaking about that in, in just a little bit. Um, so just to, just to close, if anybody wants to play the games that are on Game Up, there are dozens of really awesome games there uh, in the Expo Hall. Um, you can also go there and play. They're, they're, they're free to play. And if anybody has a really terrific game that they want to get into the hands of more students, um, Brain Poppers, if you could stand up for one second, if you're here and from Brain Pop, that guy, that guy, that guy, <laughs> Allison. So if you talk to one of them, they would love to help you get your, your games into more students' hands. Thank you.